Hi everyone, it is Shana from the EAG. And as you all know, I always come to you when there's something very important to speak about. Um, usually we have things that are a lot, you know, very inspirational, happy successes that we're planning to share. Um, but this time we realize that there's something really serious that's going on and we are pleased to have with us today Mr. Julio Camacho, Marine Ecologist at the National Parks Authority. Hi everyone. And we're here to talk about coral reefs or excuse me. Coral bleaching. Coral bleaching. Dead, dead, dead. Dead. The death of the coral reefs. Um, and so today we're just going to be having this little short information session because we've seen a lot of y'all on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, sorry, X, um, talking about, you know, engaging with Rulio's posts and wondering, wait, that's how bad things are. And it is that bad. And so rather than you having to Google or anything, we want to do a quick rundown of all the information and facts so that you're empowered with the information and can do something about it. So Julio, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me, Shana. Okay. Really so first it. of all, remind us what is a coral and a coral reef? Because you know the people and then we're starting from scratch. Right, okay. If you can start from scratch, then we have to have a quiz. The mm. first quiz is a coral or animal or plant. <laughs> all right. So corals are actually part animal, part plant. It's something that we call symbiosis, and I won't get into all of that right now. The main thing for you to know and for you to understand for what we're going to talk about is that um, corals are a very tiny animal. They're made up of a coral that you see is made up of thousands, probably millions of these animals. Mm -hmm. Within each animal lives a plant, right? And the reason being is, you know, you go beach and you have these clear waters mm. and the turquoise, beautiful things that we mm. boast off about. Right. It's because they don't have any nutrients. Oh. It's like, it's like a desert. It's just, oh. it's just, there's nothing in there. Think oh. about a glass of water with nothing in there. Yes. Clear. Okay. okay. Nice okay. tamarind juice that you mm. buy. You can't see through that, right? Right. So we want the grainy stuff and them in there. No, we actually don't want them. Okay. But, that, but the point is, our waters are clear because... There's no nutrients. Mm. And so because of that, the corals by themselves can't get enough food from the water. So they use that plant to help them to make food. Mm. So that's why it is a part animal, part plant. Okay, so as a reminder, the coral, it's an animal with a plant living up inside of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about the status of the coral reefs that are here in Antigua, Barbuda, and don't forget Redonda. Well, you can't forget <laughs> Redonda because Redonda is the danda. You have to know that. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so Caribbean corals, and in, in particular Antiguan and Barbudan and Redondan corals, we're about average for the Caribbean region, at least what we're seeing pre-July 2023. Um, we're having anywhere between 10 to 20% coral cover, which isn't great. Mm -hmm. It's not the greatest, but it's actually something that's been slowly climbing up based on the data that we've been seeing. Because I remember, um, and some of you may know, in 2015, mm -hmm. um, Antigua and Barbuda put out a coral reef report card. And mm -hmm. right back then, the, 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 the stats weren't looking too good at all. Yeah, we, we weren't great <laughs> in the coral, but surprisingly, we were great in, in like fish biomass and, and all this stuff. But that's, that's, that's a whole other conversation that we won't get into. Okay. But our corals are kind of in that midway between point, and we've been seeing some some good news essentially okay. some areas of hope areas of um okay exponential growth that we're very so basically happy we weren't doing we're at the top of the class but we're not we're, at the back of the class no 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 and we see where we could go we're mid-range and you know yeah you had some aspects of it they were like we're trying to get to the front of the class so okay we're okay. very happy about that and then tell us a bit more about what are the types of corals that we have here in antigua and barbuda so one of the most in my opinion, all corals are pretty. All cor corals are beautiful. Mm -hmm. But one of the most popular ones is what we call the elkhorn coral. Okay. Right? Um, it's a very kind of orangish coral, very big. And, and it, that along with his cousin, the, the staghorn, they're the primary growth species. So they're the fastest growers. Mm -hmm. And when I say the fastest growers, they grow about 20 centimeters a year. And that's all fastest growers. Right. Wow. But they're like branches. They, they put out these big branches and they create a lot of habitat. And within that habitat, you have fish and other creatures that live with them. So mm -hmm. so you have those and then you have stuff like the brain corals. And there's many, many different types of brain corals. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are the slow growers. Right. So those grow about one to three centimeters a year. Wow. So when you see a brain coral the size of a table, 
Think about it, it growing upward and sideways about one to three centimeters a year in ideal conditions. Okay. That's when things are great. Wow. Right? So think about how old you're talking about, 100, 200, 300 year old coral something. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So as a recap, we have the elk horn and elk the stag horn. Yes. And those, if you all think about the fallow deer and the horn, the antlers. Just like that. That's what Just they look like. like. We Just have like the brain that. coral that yeah, has brain. all of the grooves like the brain. Mm -hmm. And then I also know about the fire coral. The fire coral is, 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 you know, many people's least favorite coral, mm. but it's just, it's, it's a tough defender. That's what I was saying. <laughs> it has a little sting, you know, a little right. pepper. They don't want to be um, ramped with. That's basically no, no. it. But no coral should be ramped with. Right? Correct. You really shouldn't be touching corals at all. And, and it's very simply the oils in your skin can actually damage corals. So I want to put that out there. If you see corals, don't touch them. Mm -hmm. You really shouldn't be touching up corals. And even if you are snorkeling or diving, you know, we dive by keeping our hands to our side. That's mm -hmm. how we learn. Mm -hmm. So that's just another tidbit. And so you spoke a bit about the oils. So, so people touching and handling corals, that's mm -hmm. a big threat to them. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other threats to corals here? Okay, so if we start from, from kind of low to small to big mm -hmm. um sometimes lotions and sunscreen in particular certain types of sunscreens aren't good for coral and there's a mm -hmm. lot of reef friendly sunscreen out there they should be paying attention to mm -hmm. um things like pollution and this is not just you throwing a bottle into the sea you throwing a bottle on the land also ends up going into the sea or you um emptying your sewage onto the land or throwing away your oil onto the soil mm -hmm. everything filters through especially on an island and eventually makes it way towards the marine environment so that's not really good mm. um so you have that then you have um, improper coastal development mm. so when you have dredging mm. and a loss of of terrific ecosystems like your mangrove wetlands mm. your seagrass beds you know those kind of stuff they, they play very key roles in in this tandem with coral reefs and so the loss of these ecosystems are major mm -hmm. and then and the big ones are, are things like diseases. So diseases are a big one. Yes. And climate change. Okay. And climate change has many different impacts. Eh? So you have increased frequency and, and intensity of storms. And then you have um, sea level rise and sea temperature elevation. Mm -hmm. And then they've also shown that climate change leads to more diseases. Okay. Because diseases like warmer environments. Yes, they do. So the warmer the environment, the more the, the more disease is going to spread. It's just, it's just unfortunate. And the poop. warmer it is, the more storms are gonna come. So, basically, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just <laughs> not good. I think sometimes when we're talking about climate change, people think we're just joking. Like, oh, they always make everything about climate mm. change, but literally everything is related to climate change. Yes. Especially for our Antiguans and Barbudans, we see what this hurricane season has been. Mm -hmm. Everybody keeps saying to us, oh, but wait. It's October. We don't usually get storms in October. Okay. The climate is changing. Mm -hmm. This is going to be our new norm. You can't just, oh boy, this can't be the same sun we grew up in. It's, it's literally not. not. We're getting more of the rays because the ozone layer is going. Like You have to pay attention to these different things because they're not by coincidence. Mm -hmm. They're all related to climate change. And so you mentioned about the... Higher the hotter water. Oh, let me sti water. let me stick a pin. Let me stick a pin on that. <laughs> Y'all, I'm sitting up and taking over. I have some people who are going to the beach and like, mm, the water feeling a little warmer than usual. A little. And they say, oh, I kind of oh. like it. Or eh? some of them they say, oh, boy, the water, the sea water coming like tea right now. So if it's warm for you, how you take the corals feel? And they can't leave. No. You think, oh, you can go in the water and then just when you feel uncomfortable, you just, out. bam, oh. That's just, uh, they don't have an AC. They can't go install no. the AC. They can't, you oh, know, they, they can't can do, do a bun up. They just have to deal with it. Literally. They just have to deal uh, with so it. So speaking of that, Rulio, let's talk a bit about how this climate change is affecting the reefs from the increased sea temperatures, the more storms, the ocean acidification. Tell mm. us a bit more. Everything. Okay, so that's... Uh, Boy, that's a mouthful. So let's let's put this. You have to put the own foot for this one. Right? This is getting serious now. So um, if I was to talk about, let's talk about storms first. And the thing with storms is that naturally, in a natural functioning system and in a healthy coral reef system, storms aren't inherently bad. Right. Right. Because corals can grow by fragmentation, where you break off a piece, and then you can put it somewhere else and once the conditions are right, it will, it will start, start growing. growing. On its own. So storms actually one of the ways that reefs used to naturally expand. Okay. Because the storm would come through once every 10, 15 years mm -hmm. or whatever, Broke up break a up piece. reef, 
They spread out some more, then they start to grow, so you have the reef expanding. Okay. But now you're getting storms every year. And you're getting, even if we're not getting a hurricane in Antigua, you get these increased weather systems and, and heavy swell events and, and all that kind of stuff. And those mm -hmm. just are constantly, constantly hitting on the reef ecosystem. They can't it. handle it. This just, it. It becomes too much, especially when you put it with pollution and all these other poor ecosystem management. It's really a lot for them. So that's, that's the storm one. Um, the other one that you have to think about, and, and it's what we want to talk about, especially today, is elevated sea temperatures. So a lot of persons are talking about, oh, they go into the water and the water feels a little bit warmer and it's nice. Although I've heard some persons say that it's just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like they go in beach early and early in the morning now because they're trying to get the water just a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. So you remember when we talked about corals? Yes. You remember I tell you corals are part animal, part plant? Yes. Right. So corals are, are weird. Mm. So when a coral gets uncomfortable, okay, right? I'm when it the coral. when it's in this warm water, mm. it's trying to sweat and it can't sweat mm. and it just can't deal with it. Mm. You know what the corals do? They get rid of the plants. Oh, eviction notice. They just not even notice. Just bite. Oh, <laughs> bye. Boot out, boom. You know what? Me done. done. Just just spatter. Just so just, just, just one time. End. <laughs> So what they do is they, they kick out the plant part, mm -hmm. right? But you remember I said that the corals by themselves, the animals can't make enough food. No. They need the plant. Because they're animals. You don't like plants? You don't like animals, Shana? I thought you were a, a bird. Let's, let's get back okay, on to right. the, the topic at hand. <laughs> so Mr. because they don't have the plants in them anymore, right? They actually start to starve. And... The reason why, so the process of coral bleaching, what we call coral bleaching. Wait there, so they're burning up and they're starving? Yes. Yes. And, and why we call it coral bleaching, right, is, so everybody know what limestone is? Yes. That white, uh, whitish rock kind of thing. Harrison's Cave Barbados. Or Barbuda. Just, or Barbuda. Just, you don't have to go out with yeah. Barbados. Barbuda, yes. right? There, right? <laughs> so corals secrete limestone okay that's part of the hard structure that you see mm -hmm. that's limestone or calcium carbonate if you want to get into the scientific name mm -hmm. so corals secrete limestone right mm -hmm. so when they evict the plant mm -hmm. you can then because corals the animals are translucent the mm -hmm. plants it will give them the color right so when they evict the plant you're seeing the white skeleton and that's why mm -hmm. we call it coral bleaching right what happening what we're seeing right now is this warm water that everybody feeling mm -hmm. The corals have been feeling it for months. Oh. And they've been evicting the plants, but because the warm water has stayed warm, they haven't been able to take the plants back in, so the corals are dying. So what kind of temperatures are we talking about, Rulio? We're seeing, in the Caribbean, we've seen up to 91, 92 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> right? Um, it's been, it started going up. It started elevating late April, and then it kind of held a bit, and then late middle to middle august also it jumped up again and the corals they could not handle it so just so everybody's on the same page the corals they can bleach so they can evict the plant but if once things cool down a bit they can get them back and get back to themselves they can get it back if it happens within a short enough time span okay but if they are if it's too hot for too long they can't they can't get, get back, back the plant and, and so they start to starve and as they starve and they don't get out of the plant, they die. And the reality is right now, based on what we're seeing in Antigua, in Barbuda, we haven't been to Redonda since the, the, the high temperature started. But based on what we're seeing throughout the Caribbean, over 90% of all corals are bleaching right now. And bleaching to the point where it's happened for so long that they're it's, just, they're going, they're they're, gone. they've gone off the cliff. So it's... You dive, and it's like somebody said to me the other day, they feel like they're diving in a graveyard. Because things that were alive, things that, things that I saw growing from since I was seven, I used to go snark around. I saw this thing when it started this small, dead. Just, and, dead. And even though these coral reefs are dead, you know, we're scientists, Rulio, really, so mm. we're on the ground, we see these things, we're like, wee you, wee you, wee you. Why should a regular Antiguan or Barbudan or Redundant um, care about, okay, the coral reef and them, so what, are dead, so what? So the thing is, you have to remember that the, the lifestyle that we have mm -hmm. is heavily dependent on coral reefs. The shoreline protection, the nice clear waters, the, the fish that you love to eat, the lobster that people love to have in the fridge during cold season, but you know, we can leave that one alone, right? 
all of those depend on our coral reefs, right? Because, and they depend on the living coral reefs because the living coral reefs give out what we call an environmental signature that attracts more life. Mm. And even though you can have a structure out there that will hold life, it won't hold as much life as if it was living, mm -hmm. right? And because we're seeing so much death, you then get the limestone is then just by itself. And remember you talked about, you touched ocean acidification earlier. Yes. Ocean acidification then weakens the limestone. So when you know we're getting these storms more often, now you have weakened limestone, which are now breaking apart, which then affects our coastline. And the scary part about that is, we know climate change is a thing, mm -hmm. right? We've been arguing for climate change for years and, and we really haven't taken it as serious as we need to. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, climate change predictions, were, we weren't supposed to have these kind of impacts for the Not next... Not yet. Till about 2050. We're in 2023 and we're seeing them. Like, we're at the point where I know that there's certain populations of corals around Antigua and Barbuda that are unlikely to survive after this year. Like, they, they just won't be there. Make it. But that's 2023. Yeah. We're at the beginning of the impacts of climate change. So what does tomorrow mean? Yeah. And especially for a country that is so tourism dependent as ours, you know, the tagline is the beach is just the beginning. Mm. But if you don't have no beach, what do you have left? Exactly, exactly. Right? And so as a local, you need to also be thinking about the economic impacts of this coral bleaching because if there's no corals... It's going to impact the fish. The fish are full can yam. The mm -hmm. hotels can yam. The tourists can yam. The communities can yam. The government can yam. Ah, we can yam. Ah, we. <coughs> it's gone to the point where I've seen Rulio even talk about changing fields because there's not going to be, to be a any corals to left to survey and to study. That is how mm -hmm. bad things are at right now. So let's wrap this up now, Rulio. We've mm. talked a lot about the bad things, mm. but what is, let's try to end off on a positive. What is some things that people can do to do something? To make a difference? To make a difference for the corals or to at least tell others about the situation. So there's two things I always say to people. Um, one of them is be a better environmental steward. Mm -hmm. So treat the environment like how you wish somebody to treat you. Keep it clean. Don't pollute it. Make sure you, you follow the regulations that are put in place to preserve biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Then the second major thing that any and everybody can do is make reports. Mm. So you're, you're out and you see something that you think might be weird. Everybody have a phone. Take a picture. Send it to an environmental agency. Mm -hmm. you, might, you might think you're being annoying. You might think it's not important. But you'd be surprised about how many times we find out things are happening. Because, of... because somebody just say, hey... You know, I saw this. Or you talk to somebody like, yeah, I noticed that happening for the last three months, but I figured y'all know. Mm -hmm. How will you know if you don't tell us? Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to tell us, right? So those are the basic things that I think any and everybody can do. Mm -hmm. Then you can start ramping it up. You know, you can start pressuring your policymakers mm -hmm. and, and ensuring that we're making the right management decisions and ensuring that if we're protecting things like our mangroves, we're not destroying them to build more hotels and mm -hmm. these kind of things and making sure we're not dredging areas, making sure that we're not polluting too much and throwing stuff into the sea. Mm -hmm. Those kind of impacts are the next step. And then the one above that is ensuring that as a country, mm -hmm. we're giving the best example. Yes. Right. So we're trying to be as green friendly as we can be within our limitations because we all have limitations. I can't mm -hmm. tell you to go stop driving because you have to get to work. Right? right. So I, I, I won't tell persons to do that. I can't tell you to go buy an electric car because I'm not giving you the money to buy an electric car and mm -hmm. our electric company is still powered by diesel. Right. All right. So I won't say that. But what I will say is by being a env better environmental steward, mm -hmm. being a better person, being a better environment friend mm -hmm. and ensuring that when environmental agencies are putting out regulations, it's not that we're just pulling it out the top out of a top hat and be like, oh, today yes. we're going to do cool lobster. Tomorrow oh, yes. we're doing this. It's science. It's data. It's information that we've collected and based on what we're seeing, that's why we're saying these things need to happen. And it's extremely important that we follow that. Yeah. Um, and I think in general, people tend to look at the climate crisis as one thing and the biodiversity crisis as another. And they are... They're not even twins. They're an entanglement. They're an entanglement. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even <laughs> twins. They are completely intertwined. Okay? So you cannot look at one and look at the other. 
because as much as I might have a wind turbine or a solar panel, mm -hmm. if the coral reefs and them are have nothing for yam, I can't eat the solar panel. I can't eat those kinds of things. I can't eat the money in your pocket either. I can't eat the money in my pocket. And so one of the big things is realizing that these two things are having an impact on me. Another thing we have to realize, Antigua and Barbuda, we're a small island developing state, right? If the shorelines are going and the coast is eroding, we have to move inward. Okay, but when we move inward and more inward and we don't have any more space, where do you think we're going to go? So. And it's not just you, eh? It's a future generation. So you may be like, oh, okay, but you know, Antigua big enough for me. Okay. So your kids, nieces, nephews, the next generation, where they can go. And that is why as a lot of the work of the EAG and the National Parks Authority is to monitor these ecosystems, is to work with these species, and to tell you guys so that you're empowered with the information to do something about it. Because we want to see these ecosystems um, stay for not just this generation, but for generations to come. To come. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Rulio, for coming. Thank um, you for having me. And for anytime. telling us a bit about the dire situation the that dire we're situation. in um situation. and so i'm sure we'll have you back again to talk about many other stuff. many other things <laughs> um but leave any questions or comments you have in the comments below um and this has been us talking about bleaching all right if it bleach and it fits you don't bleach corals <laughs> <laughs>